This is Comic Geek Speak, episode 73. Welcome to Comic Geek Speak, brought to you in conjunction with WorldFamousComics.com, your spot on the internet for the best comic book and entertainment related columns, contests, features, reviews, news, resources, and more. I'm Brian Deemer. And I'm Tasha Deemer. I'm Matt. I'm Jamie D. I'm Lana Taylor. And I'm Catherine from Philly. And I'm Peter Rios. We are sexy bitches, yeah! <laughs> You guys are officially sexy bitches now. <laughs> oh, like we weren't before? Thanks. As opposed to before, you weren't official. <laughs> you know, I have to say, as soon as we're done here, i got to go home and watch Rambo, because it kind of just lowered the masculinity. You need to explain that. Oh, see, I didn't hear the music over here. You didn't hear the music? You're lucky. No, we no. can't hear the music. Oh, you missed, no wonder, you missed why we were laughing so much. I was wondering, there was like breathing, I thought it was heavy breathing on the line. That was oh. Peter. <laughs> I don't... Well, no, don't they normally hear? Yeah, they that? sound. Yeah, they do. What the heck's that all about? Oh, that's that. I was on a different input now. Oh, all right, here, ladies, for your sake. <laughs> He's on that third input. That's Here's right. the. <laughs> oh, Jesus, Jamie. <laughs> here's the, here's the uh, opening music that we played in in lieu of the normal comic geek speak music. I'm sure. I'm sure Catherine's seen this in the office. Did you hear it now? Did you hear it that time? Hello. What the heck is going on? Did you hear that? We that heard that. <laughs> Did you hear that now? That was fabulous. That was Peter singing, wasn't it? No. <laughs> That's actually Brian's ringtone. No, it's not. <laughs> Catherine, have you That's seen that and, or going around the office at work? I have not yet seen that. Really? Uh-oh. The Numa Numa dancer? <laughs> I'm really quite sad, especially working oh. in an internet company. I have no excuse whatsoever. How can that possibly be? I don't think she was in the gate do, do a search on Google, uh, Yahoo videos for Numa Numa, and, and Numa it, Numa. You'll, it'll come up. It may, maybe is it she scarier actually... than Teletubbies? Because I don't know what's scarier than Teletubbies. No, this is hilarious. <laughs> yeah, maybe she actually works at her job instead of like you do. and then No, she doesn't. <laughs> That's true. I listen to you guys all day. What do you think? We should make some formal in- introductions now. I, I suppose so. A way to be professional. Right. We have <laughs> on the phone with us via conference call. Uh, Lena Taylor of I Read Comics and Catherine of Philly, a uh, frequent listener and our, our first female listener, right? Well, the first person to send us, to an, send email, us an email. Anyway. Yeah. Let's say yeah. that. Right. We'll give you that. Okay. So I'm welcome sure that to there the are sh- many, many female listeners. Oh, yeah, there are. But you are our first. So. <laughs> the first is always memorable. That's right. <laughs> Oh my God! We can't. You know, you get some women in the on the phone, and we can't contain ourselves. <laughs> and here, Tasha's sitting here, all quiet. Hi, Tasha. Hi, Tasha. How are you? I'm fine. As I kick the microphone stand. <laughs> so, should we go through our announcements first? Yes, we should. Uh, this episode of Comic Key Speak is sponsored by the New York City Comic Con, uh, which will be in. New York City in February, the 25th and the 26th. Uh, It's 25 bucks for a ticket for one day or $35 for uh, a two-day pass. And uh, it's going to be a big shindig. They just announced Todd McFarlane is going to be a guest of honor. So uh, he doesn't go to a lot of conventions. So if you're a big fan of Todd, uh, make sure you get there because who knows when his next appearance will be. Uh, Catherine, are you going to get to that? I'm going to try to. Very cool. With the babysitter. Cool. So just go one day, and 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 we'll buy your ticket. There's five of us, <laughs> six of us here. We can we can afford a one day ticket am, for. Oh no no, I'm strongly tempted. I, I'm. It's very probable that I have some you know logistics to work out. Normal parent stuff. All right. All right. Very good. What, what do you mean? Kids are usually small enough. You can put them in the under uh, you know the cargo bay. <laughs> Save yourself a couple bucks. Cargo bay. <laughs> 
<laughs> in the plane, he'll be flying up there from Philly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Just, just give him a parachute just in case. <laughs> Everything should be all right. Uh, yes. So anyway, go to the New York City Comic Con. It's going to be a big deal. It's going to be cool. We're going to be there so you can say hello. All right. Uh, contest reminder. Uh, our contest for this month is sponsored by uh, DCB Service and InStockTrades.com. Uh, they're going to be doing some sponsorships for us in the future, and they want to have cool theme music for when they when they when they do their spots. And so they're asking you, the audience, to create theme music for them. Uh, they want something exciting and uh, and superhero-y. So get to work with GarageBand or your other music programs and, and come up with something. The winner, which will be picked by Cameron at, at DCB Service, receives $100, uh, basically, gift certificate to InStockTrades.com. So you can get whatever the hell you want, and you got 100 bucks to spend. So it's a heck of a prize. So get your entries in. <clears throat> Any of you ladies handy with the music? Not so much. Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, then you don't get any trades. That's your own fault. <laughs> and uh, a Book of the Month Club reminder that this month's selection is Goon, Volume 1. Uh, if you want to read along with us, you can get Goon, Volume 1 at InStockTrades.com for 40% off, as well as Goon, Volume 0 and 2 and 3. They're all on there for 40% off, so go to town. So, what are we talking about today? Don't look at me. I have no That's idea. That's a cue for, the, for you. So we, we got the chicks on. That's what we're waiting for. Oh. <laughs> you know I say that with nothing but love. Um, <laughs> just ask, we want, you want to do the topic that we talked about? Oh, well, shouldn't they ask us the question first? Of course. All the oh, questions. Oh, That's true. Down the job. Let's go. Gee, I'm sorry. The question. Settle. All right. When did you first start reading comics? Go ahead, Lena. Oh. Uh, I started reading comics when I could start to read because I had two older brothers who read comics. And they bought them and they were around the house and that's just what I picked up. And I still have those collections that my brothers and I bought when we were just kids. So they go back pretty far. The first comics that I actually bought for myself, I think they were little Archie comics. Which is really embarrassing to admit, but there you go. <laughs> Why? I mean, Jamie and I yeah, started with Richie Rich. Richie Rich for yeah. me. <laughs> I, I used to buy Muppet Babies. <laughs> now that I wouldn't admit. <laughs> yeah, you better keep that to yourself. That came out like in the late '80s, though, right? That was last year. I yeah, it was like '86, '87. <laughs> How old were you then? Thirteen. I don't know something. Like that. Oh, that's sad. I don't know. You know. It was a big cartoon. It was popular it, it on could've, TV. It could have been Barbie. That 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 is the one worse. Yeah, that's true. Maybe Could've My Little gem. Pony. Strawberry Shortcake. <laughs> yeah. What about you, Catherine? Well, I always love when you guys ask this question because I'm always really impressed by the number of people who actually say that their moms give them comic books, like to encourage them to read and stuff like that. I'm so tempted to make just like a big sound sample CD of all the different people saying, well, my mom gave me comics. Well, my mom wanted to shut me up, so she gave me comics. You know, we bought them at the Cinerac, at the food store, at the whatever. You know, and just send it to the distributors and say, hey, guess what? Moms are involved, you know, women who don't even know about comics, who aren't even comic geeks, give these things to their kids, and then they pick them up and read them and then become indoctrinated for their whole lives, you know. But um, <laughs> there are, if anybody out there actually is listening from a distributorship and wants to email me about that, I'd love to have any of my thoughts, you know, shared among your little marketing people. Yeah. But, uh, sorry, you know, that's my little rant on the forums. I'm always talking about <laughs> yes. the loss of the spinner racks and how frustrated that makes me. But the first, I think my first exposure to comics was when I was about 13 years old. And it was specifically one weekend when my mother walked into my room with my mother, actually. She walked into my room with four huge, like, IBM copy paper boxes full of her comic collection. She'd noticed that I'd been doing some drawing, and she's like, you know what, if you want to draw people, here's some really good reference material. And lo and behold, it was her whole, like, X-Men run and her wow. New Mutants and Cloak and Dagger, everything just from probably around, like, 130 and then up all the way to 180, I think, at the time it was, around 1982. But uh, the first one I went out and bought, I think, was probably X-Men 186, some, somewhere around there. But, you know, stayed mostly with the Marvel line and picked them up whenever I went to the mall, Walden Books or the, you know, drugstore or wherever I happened to be. And read them until, well, you know, the 90s. You guys have talked about that many times before. 
cool. cool. I do want to say I was in a um, small deli kind of 7-Eleven type of thing in Washington, New Jersey last night, and uh, right they did have a spinner rack there with comics. It was right next to an issue of uh, over 40 women. It was... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> Some other this is weird not how titles. old we are. <laughs> but, uh, no, it was, you know, they got comics and porn there, I guess. That was their magazine selection. Well, what but else is there? The, they still had the comic spinners, and they were pretty recent titles. So they're not completely That's gone. Nice. Are we fulfilling your alpha male uh, rant, <laughs> Lena? Alpha monkey. Alpha monkey thing? <laughs> comics and porn, you know, I have no problem with that. I, I think you guys could work a little harder at it. I don't know. I'm, I'm not feeling it yet. Not feeling it. <laughs> Okay. We, we could take our clothes off and then really go to town. God, no. Just no. let Matt will drink a few more Mountain Dews and he'll be right there for you. Jeez. Oh, my gosh. So what are we talking about today? Comic shops. Comic shops? Yeah. So that was a discussion you guys had had once before, and I think it was on the boards as well, about how to make comic shops a more welcoming environment to women. Which was brought up by, uh, in an email by uh, one of our listeners. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we thought about it, and we had some ideas. And I think some of the really basic ideas don't necessarily apply to just women. It's more to um, people in general. Like the shop probably shouldn't smell like sweat socks, as so many of them do. That would help a lot if they smelled normal. And if they weren't kind of dark and dingy, which many of them are. So when you walk in, it's like going into a haunted house or something. But um, I think Catherine and I were thinking more along the lines of, you know, maybe combining a comic shop with, like, I don't know, a nail salon or, like, having masseuses there where you could maybe get a pedicure or something. We could make it yeah, a brothel as well. Then or something. <laughs> yeah, I think that would work. Or you could have perfume samples, you know, by the register. That would be good. And doilies. Lots and doilies. doilies. And, and potpourri. Definitely potpourri. Oh, definitely satchels of potpourri. Oh, the and the little Febreze sheets, too. <laughs> yeah, those would be good. So, you know, any of those things would work for us. I think that would make it a much more welcoming environment. Play some nice Enya music, you know, when you walk in there. I would like that a lot. That'd be great. Now, as you long as they don't... I the big stand-up of Christian Bale with his shirt off. The, the stand-up of Christian Bale would be good, too. I would like that. Or, or Viggo Mortensen. That would be really nice. As long as they don't spritz my comics with the, with the free perfume samples, because the little perfume could put moisture dots on it and ruin the value, you know? I mean, are those good ideas or what? As long, uh, as, guys no. are, as, long as guys are allowed to reattach their balls on the way out. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, I, like I, I, I want to turn my one bastion into a smelly chick store. That's really what I want to do. <laughs> Would the chicks be smelly or the store be smelly? Well, the store is usually smelly. I, I avoid those, you know, like, like the plague. Not that I smell, but... Um, you know what? I think... That actually goes with a good theory that to get guys to go into, like, salons, they should have it, uh, strippers actually work there. And then guys would go in there and they might consider getting their nails done as well. Whose theory is that? That's mine. I'm <laughs> Whose working theory on. is that? <laughs> I've never heard that theory before. Matt's and Matt's alone. Maybe they put comic books in the salons. <laughs> okay. No, okay, on a more serious note, yeah, yeah. What, are, what are your, what are your uh, ideas? I did seriously have a question about the front window area of the comic shop. And normally it is plastered with, you know, big cutouts and posters and things like that. Is it really just because of sunlight exposure that is the big concern, why they're so close off? I, I think it's more, at least when I was working there, it was more advertising. We were more trying to get the people to come into the store, trying to advertise something and the bigger it is, you know, if it's, if it's smaller, people aren't going to stop and look. But if it's big and, you know, bright and all that, it's, you know, people are going to stop and look. I, I never thought to use it as, you know, sun protection, at least the stores I've worked at uh, that have had outside, you know, exposure. But it was more to get that person to stop into the store. Especially when we worked at the Penn Avenue store because it was right at the corner of a very busy intersection so when cars are stopped at red lights, they can look over and see a life-size Superman or something and go, oh, hey, that's interesting, where they never see something small or if the window was just empty and you could see into the store from their car, they wouldn't be able to see what it was going on. So that definitely worked as a marketing ploy. And sometimes Scott, the one guy who works there, was, was a very talented artist, would paint huge you know, uh, pictures 
on the windows, you know, with temper paints or whatever, and like really awesome superhero collages and stuff. And and again, it was simply for marketing purposes. Do either of you uh, go to your local comic stores? I used to go to the one in Berkeley um, because that was a great store, but I don't live very close to there anymore. And the one that's here in the town where I live now is not very welcoming. It's not very welcoming to most people, I would imagine, because it's kind of a creepy place. Um, I wanted to, to mention one other thing, and, and guys who have worked in stores, or if you can talk about the stores near you, who gets to decide like what goes up near the front for your first walk in? Because one of the things about the store in Berkeley that I disliked was that as soon as you walked in the store, they had a very large display that had the most ultra-violent anime and manga stuff, <laughs> like right there when you walked in. So you were immediately faced with many issues of blood and people being dismembered. And then they would have the, the sex stuff, the anime sex stuff, right next to it. And I guess that was because it sold really well or they had a clientele for that. It was a huge turnoff to walk into the store and have that be the first thing that hit you in the face when you walked in. And the Love and Rocket stuff that I wanted was way in the back on a shelf that you had to kind of crawl to to get to. It, it was just was hard to find interesting things. I, I don't know who makes those decisions in stores. That's that's usually the you know, the manager of the store or whoever's running it. I know when again going back to when I was manager at the one we had one here, we always wanted to try to you know bring the kids, the families into the store. So. We put the the Archies, the any kid friendly comic. You know, there was some anime, you know, like when Pokemon and certain big uh, anime books uh, were, would come out. We put them up there, but we'd always put it would always be the kid friendly stuff, family friendly, um, and then we'd start with either Marvel or DC. We'd always separate them, and um, then we'd go Independence, and then we put the more adult stuff towards the back. And even some of it we put so it was hard for kids to even reach the books that were there just for that entire reason because we didn't want to turn the, turn the people off. And I agree with you. I would be turned off by walking into a store like that, seeing that stuff up front. I would think I was walking into you know some kind of sex store. And um, that would definitely... If I'm looking, you know, if I'm looking for a sex store, I want to I'll walk into a. You just sex don't store. want anybody to see you looking at the books. You want it in the back. <laughs> that's right, so I can look at all that stuff without anybody seeing me. No, but seriously, that's that's ridiculous, and that's totally that's the store that's the store deciding what they want to push, and if they want to push that that kind of stuff, they're going to put it up front, and they'll make you go to the back and look for the other stuff. But at least that's my experience. It's totally up to the store. Catherine, do you? Yeah, it's actually crazy to put stuff in the front of a store that you know people are going to come in and want to buy anyway. You know, like your average fanboy that wants to come in for a crisis, not mentioning any names in the room or anything, but if you're going to go into a comic store for a crisis, you know when the next one's coming out, you really want to try and get to, you know, the families and the kids walking by who wouldn't necessarily go into the store. And one of the things that I know that some of the clients of the agency I work with, that they do, is if they want to market something to kids, it's terrible. They really know all these studies of marketing to two-year-olds and ten-year-olds and stuff. But they put stuff down at eye level, and they have samples that the kids can play with. I mean, think of the Thomas the Tank Engine stuff, if you ever see it in, like, Learning Express or Toys R Us or anything. Maybe some loose toys, not like, you know, loose sleazy toys, but, you know, just toys scattered around, like, a table at the front near, like, a kid's area. Because one of the reasons that I don't go into comic shops is that if I bring my son in there, I don't know that there's like a space where he can stand when I'm sort of looking around the shelves that is safe for him to be at. You know, not only from what he sees on the shelves, but maybe something for him to do while I'm shopping. So it's not really easy for me. Plus, they're kind of out of the way, and just taking your kids somewhere is a huge, huge production, which is why I tend to really miss when I go into Target and not see something, you know, that I want to get as a convenience purchase right there at the register. I mean, those stupid little playing cards, no offense to any stupid little playing card people out there, but those playing cards are right there by the register at Walmart even. I don't see why some sort of really mainstream comic book couldn't be there too along with the other magazines. So no, I haven't been in a comic book store since like 1992. Sadly. Wow. The withdrawal. I know. I know, I know, and it really makes me crazy, too. But hopefully, as my son, you know, he's two and a half now, so maybe when he's, like, maybe next year, when I know that he's more controllable in a place with lots of paper that can be torn, probably will go then. Well, how do you get your books, then? 
It's been, you know, at trades, actually. Whenever I have the, because uh, we have a little bit of a budget here, and whenever I have extra Amazon points, I go and I buy trades based on, you know, what I hear you guys talk about and what I read on the forums and things. Cool. And the library. Don't forget the library. Oh, yes, the library. Absolutely. Thanks to the library, I was able to read Watchmen and Superman for all seasons and a bunch of other Batman books, too. God Is that the library. Philadelphia Free Library, whatever it's called, or? Yeah, this this the free library system. They've got a bunch of stuff. It's a beautiful uh, library. Lena, you've been getting noble. you've been getting some books from the library too, and doing reviews on your show. Is there more? Do you, is it a huge selection? Where you it is. They they seem to go really deep on some things. Like they basically have everything that Alan Moore has ever done, which astonished me when I looked in there. And then I think there's kind of a spotty selection of some of the other stuff. And where I am, the, the local libraries are kind of small, but they're all linked with an interlibrary loan, so you can basically order it from any library that's in the area. And they'll deliver it up to your local library, and you can get it. So it's worth spending a little bit on, on time online at the library website, just looking for stuff and putting in a request for it. If it's not on the shelf, just ask them for it, and chances are they can get it for you somehow. And Catherine, you spend a whole day at, at Borders or Barnes & Noble? Where'd, where'd you go? That day? Yeah, my idea for fun on a day off is to go and sit and have a cup of coffee, like for the whole day at Barnes and Noble, and just like read and browse through the shelves and stuff like that. It's so not what you get as a parent. <laughs> but um, yeah, I actually went one whole morning and got a ton of stuff of Avengers disassembled, just a bunch of things that I wouldn't normally have ordered sight unseen, things I wasn't familiar with, just to do kind of research on it. And um, then you know, I bought the one or two things that I that I actually liked. I actually kind of like the That's idea of being able to go to the library because I know there's a couple trades that, and storylines that I want my reading, but I really don't need to own them. So rather than spend the money, if you can't borrow them from somebody, it, it sounds like uh, I should start hitting the Philadelphia Library when I'm up in that area. Has anybody gone to the library at all and here in Reading? Has anybody checked? I haven't checked. No. The, we'll have to do a search on online or something. They did at a time, again, when I go back to working, uh, they were doing it. Uh, there were people coming in. Uh, the one woman had a budget, and she was ordering from us, and we would suggest stuff to her. But it was basically for the bookmobile. I don't know if they actually put it in the library itself, but again, all of Reading's libraries are interconnected, so I'm sure if it's in the bookmobile, they could get it for you. You should walk over at lunch one day or something. You're only a couple blocks. I'm, I'm way far away from it. I where, where's we're now name? in North 8th. Where we're like around Spring Street, so it's oh oh oh, I thought you were right downtown. I, I used to be, but oh, I, okay. I could have done that, but not anymore. Tasha, have you gone gone into Golden Eagle? Is, what's your what's been your experience going over there? Yeah, I've, I've been in a couple times with Brian when he was picking something up, but and we stopped at a couple different shops in was it there was one in New York and did we go to any in Philly? I can't remember. Yeah, we were down at the one on South Street. Oh, yeah, that's right. But um, I don't know. Did you feel like you could go up and browse without being, you know, questioned and looked at and all that? In Golden Eagle, not really, because it's so, like, empty when I go show up, and it feels like everybody's staring at you when you walk <laughs> in and you don't, like, know anything, so. Well, that's because you're a girl. We always stare at the girls when they come in the comic shop. Yeah. See, that's the problem. Yeah. That's the point, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> It takes a sledgehammer with Matt sometimes. Yeah, hey, Actually, thanks. the last time I was in a comic store, I was hit on. There you and go. I was like, you know what? This is, I just don't even need this. <laughs> but isn't it flattering? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, now that I'm over 30, it's flattering. But back when I was, you know, 18, it's like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> well, how else are we going to learn our social skills? Jeez, come on. <laughs> I've actually done more browsing at the conventions than at the comic book store because I've there's so many people there that, like, they're, you, nobody's staring at you, and you can just kind of look around. Yeah, because everybody's looking there's around. There's so many yeah, people. Like and there's frenzy. there's quite a few girls there, too, so it, it's not that big of a deal. Right. But, you know, it brings up a point, and, and this is serious. If you're at a comic book store and you're browsing, there are areas where you don't even want to go to look at comic books because if you go over to where they keep some of the sex stuff because you want to see it, like Fantagraphics titles, people... Guys in the store take that as carte blanche to come over and start hitting on you because they think, oh, you're reading sex comics, therefore 
I can have you right now. <laughs> that seems to be the attitude because that's happened to me. And I don't know what that is. Just because you're looking at something, suddenly that says something about you as a person and your availability to the general male population. No, you could be reaching, reading Archie comics and we're thinking, no, you're reading about two girls <laughs> after one guy. Oh. <laughs> What you should do is show them that you're looking at the gay porn, and then they'll they'll run away. Right. Oh, it doesn't matter. Like no, I've done that, too, and it oh, doesn't really? matter. They're just like, whatever, sex, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Does Golden Eagle even have a sex? I'm going into the wrong comic stores. That's all I know. <laughs> uh, no, Well, we did have, I mean, it was one of those where we had our box. Behind the porn counter. Behind, yeah. the, behind the counter. That was also called Jamie's box. Yeah, it was my box. <laughs> and uh, you had to ask for it. Uh, and you know, we, we had some stuff, but we didn't. It was more along the lines of if you came in and ordered it, we would get it for you type deal. It was very, we had some, some. It was along the. Um, geez, I can't talk now. It was among the time that like the Veronica stuff was out there, and there were comic stores getting you know, busted for selling this stuff. So Lem just decided he didn't want it. He would special order it for you if you came in and ordered it, but he didn't keep a lot of it in the store. So. We really never had that big of a section. I mean, we had the bad girl art section where, you know, all the girls with the big hooters, uh, Lady Death, Lady, all that kind of crap. That was there, and that was, again, like I said, towards the back where the kids couldn't get to it. You actually needed to lean over a uh, section of comic, back issue comics to get to the wall where they were. So that was how we were trying to keep them out of the reach and out of the touch of, of the kids. But, um, yeah, I don't... I always thought I tried to keep it friendly in the store when, you know, women came into the store. It's, you know, you're just another customer. That's all it ever was to me. It wasn't like, ooh, there's a girl in the store. I mean, it was kind of cool to be able to talk comics with somebody, you know, with the without the Y chromosome. But uh, I, I never thought of it as anything different, just like I never look at, you know, color of skin or anything like that it's just another person in the store and if i really feel bad and and you know that we have such a bad that the comic stores have such a bad name and such a bad reputation that people are afraid to walk into them that's just my little soapbox <laughs> bravo jamie you're in the minority <laughs> yeah I, I i know i am I, because i know comic book guy from the simpsons is the norm i had i mean that's Dead that's what on. The guy like who hit on me? Oh, jeez. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> only older. <laughs> What's the fun- worst episode ever? <laughs> What's funny is if we, if if guys would like go with their girlfriends or their girlfriend slash you know base friends into like a clothing store, and if the girls working in there would hit on us, we'd be like in heaven, you know. So just yeah. <laughs> I wish something like that would happen. It'd be great. <laughs> Oh, he's in. Oh, he's coming with his girl. Huh? Yeah, but look at how the girls look in those stores compared to how the guys look ah. in the comic book stores. <laughs> Way to generalize. No. Wow. <laughs> Thanks, Tasha. I used to work at a comic book store. Yes, and I, I am now back at a comic book store, so I, I'm going to go get some ice to ice my balls. Is anybody else in here after that, that kick? That was a really good one, Tasha. <laughs> Uh, you got really, she's, you know, she's, she's really quiet, but boy, she comes through with ones. Man. She's really so quiet. And then Talk boom. about generalization, huh? <laughs> yeah, because I'm trying to think back to when I worked there, because I was in college and I was single most of the time, and he was I, a tomcat. Come I don't, on. I don't, I, I, well, I can tell you, I never hit on any of the girls that came in the store. Mm-hmm. I mean, because I, I just didn't hit on women because I, I don't know how to talk to women, <laughs> especially in college. I didn't, but uh, so I never, I didn't. I mean, I might have leered a little bit. I suppose I'm probably guilty of that, but I, I don't. I, I hope that I didn't make it unpleasant for them. I don't know, though. I can't really say. We're going to start getting emails from past customers. <laughs> I remember you, you Any brick. women out there that Brian leered at, you write into them. Tell That's them. Right. Them. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> or who enjoyed it. Or, or who enjoyed it. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and if you did, please send your picture. I was going to say, it'll be a picture. Be, Damn it, why didn't I go for it? For those of you who don't, uh, we'll have to bump this up on our thread, but Catherine wrote a really, really outstanding uh, uh, story, I don't know what else to call it, like fan fiction, whatever, about Spider-Man, uh, the little scene in Spider-Man 2 where his mask is off in the subway. Um, well, it's not even a subway, it's an elevated train. And uh, we'll have to bring that back for our new listeners, because I know that got a lot of attention. Um, is that anything? Do you, you plan on doing anything else like that, Catherine? Or are there stories and you know just sitting around that you just haven't released? 
I actually was just, that's the first time I'd written anything like that. And there's a fanfic since I was like 18. But I just love that movie so much. It was just so compelling to me when I saw it. Mm -hmm. But I felt like I had to finish that story. But, uh, yeah, I have something that's sort of waiting for me to complete it on my hard drive. But as soon as my two-year-old starts to sleep more regularly, then I'll be able to do a little bit more writing. But I'm glad you enjoyed it. I know that Miss Lane also does some writing as well. Oh, do we have to talk about that on the show? <laughs> they don't want to hear this. You don't want to frighten them. <laughs> I did like this story, Catherine. When you, when you first posted it, I thought, hmm, I don't think I want to read this because it's probably going to suck. But since you are our first female listener, I said I better read it just to, you know, placate you and, and be the nice. But <laughs> then I read it. Placate you? But then I read it. Was it was a pity read. And then, and, but then I read it, and I really liked it. And then I, I, I made sure that I told other people because it, it was good, and it was filling a gap in the story. And uh, so I was pleasantly surprised. And so I'm being <laughs> honest. I mean, well, I'm not going to lie to the woman. Jeez. I got it. It touched you and that made me happy. Yeah. Catherine's a wonderful writer, and um, I've read a lot of fanfic, and a lot of it is really crap, and Catherine's is just right up there in the, the top percentile of good fanfic. Really, really good. And that's well, exactly why I was hesitant, Lena, because so much of it is, you know, some loser guy in his basement. Th- I can write Spider-Man story, and, you know, and it's junk, so. <laughs> it's amazing how much Catherine sounds like that, too. That's, that's a great impersonation. No, I was impersonating the guys who are not like that. I know, we're busting your balls, son. Jeez. Who's the one in this room who's married? All right, who's getting laid on a regular basis? That's all I got to say. All right, all right. I don't think tonight after some of the cops. I'm going to take my wife right now and show you guys. <laughs> Just because there's two women who are guests on the show, now the whole thing is about who's getting laid? No, I have to combat their their jealous ways. That's all. I have to put them in their place. Uh, See how men, it all goes down to sex. It all goes right back back to sex. sex. Cut cut our legs out, bam, sex. That's all it is. Why do you think Columbus sailed across the sea? I mean, I don't know where you're going with that, and I don't want to know. No, I'm just saying. (laughs) Just just sit back and say, see, coming bastards and all that. Oh, my God. (laughs) How's a new one for you? You No, 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 shush. (laughs) The other thing, too, Lena, uh, we have to compliment you on your Jill Thompson episode. I am so jealous. <laughs> she was so much fun to talk to. We were just getting along. So we were on the phone for like another 20 minutes after we stopped the interview. Yeah, cool. Just yakking, yakking, yakking. It was great. And uh, she definitely wants to be back on to talk about the actual comic stuff since this was more like a, a promo for her TV show. That's great. And Lena's podcast is I Read Comics, in case I don't think we mentioned that yet. <laughs> yeah, keep yeah let's plugging those plugs in there. I'm here to help you. <laughs> <laughs> Ireadcomics.blogspot.com. <laughs> So what else do you guys want to talk about? Women, girls. Well, is there, are there, is there any other see, was there anything else? options of the comic book store that could be improved to be more conducive to women? Well, I do like the idea of the big movie tie-ins, and you guys have talked about that before, of when, like, when a superhero movie comes out, just put like that thing most prominent in the window to try and get people who have no idea about it into the store. And, you know... Stand up with Christian Bale with his shirt off. Really, you know, that kind of was serious of all the things. <laughs> it's my personal preference. So. I think it's nice when stores have variety, but sometimes variety is not the way to go. Um, the store near me has a little bit of everything and not enough of anything. So they have some new stuff, but not everything. They have some old stuff, but not enough that you want to start looking through the bins for things you might want. They have some toys, but not a very good selection. They have some bags, but not a lot, and you can't get boards. Like, they have bags and not boards. What kind of sense does that make? So I I think sometimes the owner should just decide what you're going to have and be really good at one thing and not try to have a little bit of everything and leave everybody feeling unsatisfied. Hey, I want to ask something for all three, Tasha, Lena, and Catherine. What, What do your friends, your female friends, think of you reading comics? Oh, I'm a big dork. (laughs) <laughs> I'm a geek. I am a geek. <laughs> yeah, and they know I'm a geek, too. Well, I can't answer that because I don't have any female friends, so <laughs> what? I don't know what they think of me. She literally doesn't. Wow. I tell her all the time, you got to get some, some girlfriends. Like, you, you need to go out and, and... I don't really have any friends of any sex. <laughs> yeah, Brian, you're just saying that with hopes of a three-way. That's... <laughs> No, I'm saying it because it's it's weird because you know everybody you know everybody's wife or girlfriend or whatever goes out with her friends you know one night every once in a while or whatever, and it's like she doesn't have any friends. And when she was in college, she started college I'm like all right, 
You got four years now. Find some friends. No friends. We made all the way through college. Well, that one friend who worked with her for five minutes and now is going to be your boss, Peter. You know, right. this girl. But now she doesn't work with her anymore. And it's like, we'll call her. Well, I'll get to I'll call her next week. And now, you know, never calls or never go out. Nothing. I find it really tough to make female friends who have my same interests, actually. I mean, there's not a lot of women out there who are, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's being raised like a sci-fi geek or something like that that sets you a little bit apart from the normal, you know, doily crocheting crowd out there. N nothing wrong with crocheting, of course. I do that, too. But I'm just saying, you know, some of the, the discussions that I hear, even at the office, are nothing that I can really relate to. And before I had a son, it was almost you know, crazy that I had nothing I could talk with these other women about, but at least now that I'm a parent, we can, you know, share mom stories, but... See, um, I, have that, I have that same problem. I'm not girly enough, I guess, to have girlfriends, because they all are, like, talking about stuff I don't care about. <laughs> Oprah and shit, and I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't interest me. <laughs> I'm forever going to say Oprah and shit. <laughs> I, I almost think that's the first time I've ever heard her swear. It's like I'm trying to think. I'm the same way. I could I could give two rats asses about football and sports and beer and you know I, I just so maybe it's just because those people who have more of an artistic eye or open mind you know about things in life you know we're not so pigeonholed into what what we should like as opposed to what we do like. Yeah, I'm the same way. I don't yeah. watch any sports or anything. Whatever. I I love sports. <laughs> I, but I love I love sports. But then again, I love Broadway musicals. I love right. You're all well kinds rounded. of stuff. I'm I I like to consider myself well rounded. But um, you know, and I I have friends other than these guys. Some and uh, but you know, I don't know. I mean, I just finding friends. Those friends don't share these these uh, kind of interests. They're more along the lines of the of you know what you would think normal relations would be you know sports, families, all that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, they don't they don't share any of of these kind of passions that I have. I mean, put your concerns at rest. You are well rounded. I can look at that and see it now. <laughs> oh jeez, oh, I'm on. gonna beat you up. <laughs> and you, I wanted you. You said you and I were gonna do a show together. <laughs> <laughs> this is the material. We're so, working it out. Catherine, I'll just send Tasha down to Philly, and you guys can hang out. Cool. I'll get you some of those nice soft pretzels. You won't share any with the boys. <laughs> <laughs> so, Catherine, uh, w you said you had a top five for us? I do actually have a top five prepared material. See, like show notes. Great. Um, it's called the five things I've learned from listening to Comic Geek Speak. And, Lena, if you have any to add, you can certainly do so at the end. Okay, cool. <laughs> or in the middle. Okay, number five, I wasn't alone in abandoning comics in the 90s. I had no idea that everyone just took one look at the crap fest and bailed. That, it's really astonishing. Yeah, we get email and email after, about that same thing. Every, like, almost every interview you do is like, oh, well, I stopped reading in the 90s now. Okay, number four, dogs like comics too. <laughs> you guys think that the dogs are barking because there's like a knock on the door? I think they have some commentary on artists and inkers. <laughs> it's just a suspicion. Okay, number three, and this one's pretty amusing for me, the name of the guy who used to draw the new mutants is, is pronounced Sinkevich, not Sinkowitz, like I've been saying since I've been 13 years old. <laughs> <laughs> when I saw it, his was like the first artistic style that looked not like, they, they didn't look like real people to me. It really bothered me as a 14-year-old when he took over the art for the new mutants. But I mean, since then, I've appreciated it, but I was always saying, oh, it's Sinkowitz guy. What is the Sinkowitz guy doing to my Ileana and all my New Mutants? But that three-issue story, that Demon Bear saga, because um, I, I was reading New Mutants, too, and it went from, like, Bob McLeod or something, I don't know, I forget who was drawing it, into, into Bill's work, and it was like, whoa. And I, but I still say that that three-issue Demon Saga story is probably one of the best mutant story ever, and it's, you know, not too many people know about it. Do you remember that? The art, oh yeah, distinctly. And it was, you know, Ileana's soul sword appeared and everything. The, the art looking back at it is really quite amazing. And for the time, I mean, was there much more of that sort of expressionistic stuff going on? Not really. And Very distinctive sp style. Spooky as hell. Oh yeah. 
Oh, okay. Uh, number two, uh, saying tits 12 times in a podcast will not earn you the iTunes explicit tag. Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> this episode might. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've been really good. Oh, not um, you. <laughs> <laughs> The, I forget what podcast that was. They were talking about some sort of boob situation that you saw on a, a book. That was the Power Girls. That was the yeah, Power Girls. Yeah, that's what girl. it was. And I just like, okay, that's five. That's it. <laughs> I didn't even, I just, it was, I, was, I, was like, I was like in a zen state. <laughs> it was just like, that word just kept coming out of my mouth. It was like, tits coming out Is of that your mouth. That's... <laughs> Uh-oh. And the top number one thing that I've learned from listening to Comic Geek Speak, long boxes is not a euphemism for male genitalia. <laughs> <laughs> you guys would constantly talk about your long boxes, who's long box, who had more, you know, bigger, whatever. And I was like, what the hell is a long box? I, you know, I use those little sterilite plastic containers to shove my comic books into. So, you know, I, after a little research, I discovered that, you know, it's not, you know, come up to my salon and see my long boxes. <laughs> nothing like that, you know. All on the level, ladies, if you're listening. Bravo. Bravo. That's, That's funny. I never, you know, having been spending so much time in a comic store since I was so young, you know, long box, just a regular part of my vocabulary. You know, I never even thought that there'd be someone who didn't know what a long box was. It, it would have been worse if we were all talking about our short boxes. Was, <laughs> Shane does have a lot of short boxes. Though. That's right. He's got all short boxes. Yeah. Whereas I have long boxes. <laughs> now look what you started. I was say, you never talking about again me? the same way. Oh, great. That's great. You know, actually, when I started listening in, I think it was like March or something, a few months before it came out on iTunes, I didn't even know what trade paperbacks were. You guys were talking about trades, and I'm like, what the hell? What happened to graphic novels? Like, I didn't realize, well, it isn't just a new word. It actually refers to, what is the difference exactly? Okay, I'll, for me personally, a graphic novel is an original story published in trade format. You know, it, it's it's, but it's all new material. A trade is when you reprint several issues of old stuff as or or an old hardcover into a trade paperback format. So that's for me, that's the difference. You know, one's, some, a, one's original and one's a collection. Right. Exactly. Okay. Now, trade paperback is really just a publishing term for a paperback that's not of the normal paperback size, and that term was around for a long, long time before people started using it for collections of comics. So that was kind of co-opted. From publishing lingo. Yeah, you you see that all the time in any, like you said, any paperback thing that's different size. Mm-hmm. Did you learn anything from us, Lena? You know, th- I was thinking about it when Catherine was talking, and the thing that that I really realized was that there was comics fandom, which I hadn't really known about before. I mean, I've been in and out of lots of different other fandoms that have different types of media focus. And somehow it just escaped me that there was comic fandom, that people were fans and they would get together and talk about them and be online and have these online communities that were all about comics. And it seems so obvious now that it would be like that, but I really had no idea that that existed. And I'm really, really glad that I know about it now because it's so much fun. Yeah. I'm constantly amazed at some of the emails that we get, you know, for people who, who listen to the show and just, you know, they always say, oh, it reminds me of my friends or it reminds me of when I used to hang out at the store. And, and, and just that it's still interesting and, and the arguments are still going on years after, you know. It's like nothing changes. But it's, it really is uh, – it's, it's just really cool that we can share this with, with everybody and they can share it with us. I think it's really neat. That was deep. That was deep, Peter. <laughs> I'm crying. <laughs> It's just your contacts, I think. Yes. <laughs> hey, uh, in, in our last uh, two episodes, we've talked about our favorite villains, our top five villains. Think you guys can uh, come up with a few of your favorite villains real quick? Oh, my gosh. Oh, that's so hard. <laughs> that is really hard. There's too many. <laughs> you're, um, play, you're playing with the big geeks now. You've got to have these answers right, right, right <laughs> at their fingertips. <laughs> Having just read Watchmen for the first time, and everybody's oh, watch, really watch, astonished. watch what you spoil. Watch, don't spoil. No, no, no. I'm not oh, going to spoil geez. anything. I'm not going to oh. spoil anything. I promise. Okay. The the one character in there who was sort of a villain, but I thought he was such a deep and complex villain, was the comedian, 
this is not giving anything away. He is a superhero, but he's a superhero villain at the same time, and that was really interesting to me, that he could be so bad at the same time that he was supposed to be doing good for everybody else. So I would put him as one of my, my favorite villains. And, you know, I know that you mentioned Lex Luthor in some of, in, in some of the last episodes, and I'm just really getting into Superman as... As, as a total Marvel zombie, actually, and I find him to be a compelling character. But even more than that, okay, it's such a Marvel answer, but I find Magneto to be really interesting just because he's had this huge background. I, I guess it's because I can almost understand where he's coming from. You can see where he would actually have motivation. If he's had this horrible experience in his past and he sees this genocide happening again, that you can almost really understand why he's doing what he's doing. So, so many villains just are like, ooh, I'm evil, I'm going to blow something up. You know, kind of like Austin Powers, Dr. Evil, just because I'm evil. But um, when there's real motivation, I find the characters much more compelling. Sort of the obvious choice, but I always found him kind of interesting. Well, that's interesting because n none of us picked Magneto. So, that's, I mean, he, he might seem obvious, but none of us picked him. But well, what she was saying, it's when I when I did my list, and you'll have to listen for my list. But uh, I said that I, I liked the villains that had more of the background, that were more you know well drawn, had a compelling backstory. And you almost did feel that you understood where they were coming from, even though they were evil. That just makes it that makes what I consider a good villain. And uh, you know the, the cardboard cutout, like you were saying, Doctor Evil. Just they don't interest me at all. And like, I, like Kang. Kang just conquers for the sake of conquering. You know, Kang gives me a friggin' headache. Anytime <laughs> you do time travel stories, <laughs> blood starts coming out of my ears. That's Tasha. Do you have any favorites in the books that you've read? Anything? Anybody that stood out? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> Anybody from, like, Preacher or Strangers in Paradise? I, I kind of like the... I don't know if he's my favorite villain, but the play between Daredevil and the Kingpin. Mm -hmm. Just, like, the whole relationship that they have together, I find interesting. Cool. I don't know. No, that, that's I have actually... To think, I have to think about it longer. Brian, actually, you mentioned that, too. I same didn't. thing. For yeah. the same reason, yeah. yeah. I was, I was going to say Strangers in Paradise. I always... I kind of compelled. I like uh, Tambi. She, oh, yeah. she's kind of she's kind of cool. I mean, even though she's really really nasty, she still has a rather interesting side to her. Cool. You got something queuing up over there? I could I could queue something up. How about how about a little of this? <laughs> When we try to stomp the yours. And now you have a larger audience, Peter, so you're really under, you know, got pressure now. So, Catherine, you said you had a stump the Rios? It's a very special stump the Rios. <laughs> Tonight on a very special stump the Rios. <laughs> Blossom will read the three questions. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, we decided to do a little crossover between Peter's world of comics and Peter's world of dance and the musical. <laughs> cool. So I hope these aren't too terribly obvious or that we're going to bore anybody. Consider it a little education. Okay, first question. The Depression-era sheet music salesman that leads this 1981 movie musical and tap dance extravaganza shares his last name with a sticky Marvel superhero. What is his name and the name of the musical? Did you say sticky or stinky? Uh, sticky, I'm not sure about the stinky part. <laughs> Whoa, read that one again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I thought you were a Mr. Dan's guy. Okay. Um, this Depression-era sheet music salesman that leads this 1981 movie musical shares his last name with a sticky Marvel superhero. What is his name and the name of the musical? I mean, sticky, it's got to be Peter Parker, right? Park, Parker for... Uh... Hey, don't look at me. I don't know any musicals. 1981 movie musical. Jamie, help me out here. I'm thinking Pennies from Heaven. Steve Martin? Oh, wait. Are you talking character name or actor name? Character name. Oh, see, I wouldn't know that then. If it is Pennies from Heaven. I'm trying to think of 81 movie musicals, Depression era. 
That's and that's what I'm thinking. Or is that? We'll allow help from the audience. You got me. What help? Go, f- Jamie. Yeah, I, is it Pennies from Heaven? It is Pennies from Heaven. Okay. Well, what's Steve the Martin plays Arthur Parker. Ah. Oh. So now we got the theme going, say. Ah, cool. Ready for another one? Lay it on me. This 1984 movie musical was directed by a member of the Coppola family and featured a character who shares his first name with a certain Neil Gaiman character. Oh, she's killing me with these character names. Mm-hmm. Ford Coppola did a... Or, or one of the Coppola... I said it was... Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, read, read, read it one more time. <laughs> these are too okay. smart for us. <laughs> We all uh, this is their reaction. Oh, it's fucking. <laughs> ah, this... <laughs> That's what they're doing right now. <laughs> all right, read that again. <laughs> what the heck was that? You guys didn't okay. see that either? Did you see that on the forum? Oh, I thought Dancing that actually Adam went off Batman. making stop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. Read, read it again. All right, this 1984 movie musical was directed by a Coppola and featured a character who shares his first name with a Neil Gaiman character. Oh, Neil Gaiman. I th- I'm thinking Gaiman. Neil Diamond. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder no, a comic, comic. Cherry, uh, cherry. That's it. Uh, first name. Or his name. Neil Gaiman character. Pff, the Morpheus Daniel... Mm. What else? I'm trying to think of what they would, you know, what she read. What's the What's the um, books of magic guy? What's his name? Oh, Tim Timothy. Hunter. Tim. That's a more normal hmm. name. Yeah. And uh, don't forget that uh, Nick Cage is a Coppola. Did he direct what, did, a movie? That's what I was trying to think. Did he? Did, did he? I don't he know. Did direct anything in '84? Peggy Sue got married. <laughs> well, he, he was in that. But <laughs> I know. It was Laura? Directed. He was. Directed. Which Coppola? There's what, Sophia. Was she? Was she, what, was she two she, making yeah, movies? Sophia, she was. <laughs> You want me to tell you? Do yeah, it. go ahead. It's the Cotton Club, and Gregory Hines <sighs> played Sandman Williams. Sandman, Sandman oh, right? Sandman? I should have. Who directed, who directed that? It? that was Francis Ford Coppola. Was it? Oh. Yeah, it was. Oh, I don't consider that a musical. That's that's a little tough for a musical category. No, oh, the judges are ruling. No, I'm just saying. <laughs> I, that's that, that's what really kind of threw me. If you had said like a movie. Uh, revolving around music, I might have, but I was, God, that was... But go ahead. Isn't that what a musical is? It, it's not stumped to Jamie, it's stumped to Rio, so... One more, and I'm toast. Okay. The last one... Well, these are special, so we'll, we'll give you a little flack. Um, the lead character in this 1961 movie musical, Tale of Doomed Love, shares his name with a certain metal-clad Marvel superhero. What is his name in the name of the movie? Oh, West Side Story. There you go. Tony... What the hell is that last? Does he even have a last name? I don't think he, it wasn't listed in the IMDb with Yeah, one. I don't think it is. I think it's just Tony. 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 So you weren't completely stumped. Well, that was a, a gimme. Jeez. Well, I hope you enjoyed them anyway. That was fun. Wow. Yeah. That, nice research on that. That was. That's what she's doing at work when she's not listening, <laughs> watching the, the Numa Numa dance. <laughs> Coming up with <laughs> stuff the real trivia. I, I was half expecting a Xanadu, you know, or a oh. Cop Rock. You remember that? Cop Rock. <laughs> Steven Bochco's Experiment from Hell. Yes. <laughs> Those are great. Hey, I'm going to put you three ladies on the spot now. We're going to go ultra geek on you. Ready? Uh-oh. Are you ready, uh-huh. Tasha? Are you ready? All right. Are you ready? You know, the, the fa- you know, we've heard, I'm sure our female listeners out there are sick and tired of hearing of of uh, who do we like better, Power Girl or Supergirl or Wonder Woman and She-Hulk. So I'm going to give you some uh, some names, and I want you guys to tell me which ones you prefer. Ready? Is this, yeah. an, F, is this an F. Mary kill? No, 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 not quite that bad. <laughs> I was just going to ask that. Yeah. <laughs> so, Would you prefer that? <laughs> no, I mean, is it like do we think that they're cooler or we just like them more? Nah, you just like them more. Who who'd you want to date or so? I don't know, whatever. <laughs> Ready? Cy- <laughs> Cyclops it? or Wolverine? Go ahead. Give your answer, Tosh. Wolverine. Wolverine? What about you two? Cyclops. Wolverine. Oh. Why the Wolverine answers? Cyclops, Cyclops is, is too, a... like, preppy boy. Yeah. <laughs> so why Wolverine, though? 
You like a more rugged? I'm looking at. Like I'm like, yeah, you see, you're looking at me. You go, no, no. <laughs> My chest is very hairy. You just don't ever see it. <laughs> All right, here's another one. Uh, Peter Parker or Johnny Storm? Peter Parker. I obviously I like nerdy guys. So. Oh. oh. I prefer the term geeky <laughs> to nerdy. Geeky guys. <laughs> All right, Lena, uh, Catherine. Is it is it Johnny Storm that's played by Chris Evans? That makes a difference. Sure, if you want to go Tobey Maguire and Chris Evans, <laughs> go ahead. Is that your answer, human Johnny um, Storm? Boy, that's tough. Um, yeah, I think I'd have to go with Johnny Storm. Yeah, I'd have to go with Peter Parker. Okay. Uh, Superman or Batman? Which Superman? What do you mean, which Superman? Clark Kent. <laughs> no, just uh, do this one for the comic. Superman or Batman? Which do you prefer? It doesn't have to be, you know, romance. It could be just what character you prefer, too. It could be either one. Do you like the more powerful, all-powerful all god or just the normal schmo? You could still kick the other guy in <laughs> I would say Batman, unless you're talking about Superman, um... Like Smallville Superman, then I'd oh, have to go with... Oh, you have to go with Dean... Uh, yeah, Dean, whatever the hell his name is. Tom Welling. Yeah, Tom Welling. Cool. Tom Welling's on her list. Yes. <laughs> on her okay list? That's right. <laughs> what about you guys? Gals? Women? Chicks? <laughs> Babes? Broad. Female? <laughs> Dames? Lena? Um, I think I'd have to go with Superman, and I, I know this is a big bone of contention among you guys, but I really like Superman in the first Superman movie, Christopher Reeve. Oh. That's it. Whoa. Yeah. She, she, she just melted. my answer. <laughs> All right. Well, here's one for the, more for the movies. Christian Bale Wait. or Val Kilmer? Oh, please. <laughs> it's too obvious? What's it's your answer? definitely Christian Bale. Christian Bale? Same thing with you? Oh, yeah, totally Christian Bale. Val Kilmer is, oh, God. <laughs> yeah, but Real Genius is one of the finest movies ever made. <laughs> Val Kilmer was hilarious in Top Secret, and that was it. Wasn't he in Willow? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was in Willow, okay. He knows how to handle his sword. <laughs> <laughs> his long box. <laughs> his long box. <laughs> Here's one for Lena. Conan or He-Man? Oh, come on. You know the answer to that one. Conan, if Barry Smith is drawing him there above anything else. Tasha. Um, yeah, no, no, no preference. You have to talk into the microphone. Sorry, no. Don't, don't don't shake your head. To hell with Krom. I haven't I haven't um <laughs> seen any of uh, Conan or He Man no. comics to okay. know what they look like or what their characters are like. So pretty much think Dolph Lundgren and uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Dolph Lundgren and Arnold. And one last one: Aragorn and Legolas. <laughs> Okay, so that depends. If it's a guy that I want to go out on a date with, it's Aragorn. If it's someone that I want to help me with my hair, it's Legolas. <laughs> <laughs> I can't top that answer. Tasha, I'm curious what your answer is. She's thinking. So he has that fairy hair magic? So you go with the rough, rugged, quiet one, or you go with the one that'll just lay all his emotions out on you. If you want somebody to talk or somebody to mope. Yeah, I'd probably have to go with Aragorn then. Okay. But I really like elves, so that's a tough thing. But I don't really Elf like Legolas or Leg Legolas. Legolas. Yeah, in the in the books, he seemed better than in the movie. Would you agree with that, Lena? You're a big Lord of the Rings fan. Well, it depends. I mean, Peter Jackson did a different thing with the elves in the movie than they were in the book, and you know, Orlando Bloom is good when he has like those two expressions. The confused expression and the not confused expression. But beyond that, you know, his acting range doesn't really go anywhere. That's why Elizabeth Town is going to do so well, because <laughs> Kirsten Dunst is the same way. Oh, jeez. Cool. What do you got over there? I don't know. I was looking around the forum to see if there were any interesting topics going on. You want to read, uh, finish that guy's email that we didn't finish from last episode? I don't know if I can find it. Oh. <laughs> Let me, yeah, hang on, I can find it. Hold on. Hey, we got to ask you, and I said I, I, I didn't think I was going to go this route, but I'm going to go this route anyway. Um, it's going to be a trailblazer. What you ladies, broads, 
girls think about uh, the portrayal of women in comics? Come on, I know you got opinions. I know you were yelling at the pot, at your computer or your iPod when you were listening to that episode that we uh, went on a rant on. Is this going to be a three-hour show? Oh, we still got time. We're, <laughs> we, we haven't hit an hour yet. Show. We're like seconds away from hitting an hour. Have you heard our marathons lately? <laughs> Go ahead. You got here. You, you got you got the mic. You got the way airwaves. Well, I want to hear what Tasha has to say because Tasha's not talking enough. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We're throw under the bus. Um, what I think about the portrayal of women in comics. It's kind of funny because you've been reading, like, you said Preacher, Strangers in Paradise and all that, right? And Those are some strong female. Have you read anything that has, like, some stuff that uh, you might not agree with? I don't mean to sway, you, you know, your I argument. I feel like you're sitting on a spelling bee. I don't know. I hate being put on the spot. Um, well, they're definitely drawn to appeal to the male audience more than the female audience, but then again, there are a lot of male comic book readers. Mm -hmm. So. Do you think that justifies it? No, but that's the way it is. Right, right. <laughs> um... Would I like to see more realistic women drawn? Yeah, definitely. And I think that some of that is starting, but you know, it's going to take a long time until it takes over or right. becomes more popular if it ever does or becomes accepted accepted yeah. by the mass male readership. You know, somebody did bring up an interesting point on the forum. I'm not defending it. I'm just throwing it out there. That They said that, uh, you know, all the female superheroes are drawn skinny and busty and, you know, muscular in the same way that all male superheroes are drawn with, with six-packs and pecs, you know, to poke your eye out. So, you know, is it any different... From the way men are drawn, I mean, you know, none of us in this room look like any of the superheroes in any of the comics. I do. Well, that's because you haven't seen me with my shirt on. <laughs> yeah. He looks like the Beast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just saying it. it it's, sure. it's, an obs it's an observation that's largely true. So that's all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So I, the one difference is that um, male superheroes are generally not drawn with, to paraphrase Spinal Tap, armadillos down their trousers. <laughs> that, that's that right. would be comparable. If, if the male superheroes were drawn like that, that would be more parody, I think, because there's no reason to have very muscular women superheroes who have 0% body fat to have giant balloons to, on the front of their chest. That's so true, because that. generally bodybuilding women don't have very large... No, unless they've had implants. Yeah. Well, there is that's one really good plastic surgeon in the Marvel Universe, you know. That's <laughs> and it's the creative director of all the artists, I think. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, he's paid for by Tony Stark. <laughs> but, you know, I really do wonder, because I've been a designer for like 10 years now, and there's so much different feedback that you get from all the people that you're working with. I mean, you might create a design that you think is great, and I'm sure for illustrators it's the same thing. But if it's not... I don't know, what the client wants or if it's not what your art director is expecting, your creative director wants or their director wants, then, I mean, maybe if somebody is standing behind the artist going, make them bigger, you know? Like, I wonder where that direction is coming mm -hmm. from yeah. or if it's just the artists who don't know how or don't have the time to express sexuality in some different way. I mean, these guys have to crank through these things where they figure, oh, okay, make them happy, you know, triple E chest or whatever whereas there's lots of different other ways artistically to show that a woman is sexy without having, you know, ginormous gabanzas on her chest. Oh, come <laughs> on, say tits, come on. That's uh, fine, I'll leave that to you, Jamie. <laughs> but, I would, you know, there was the episode of Smallville a couple weeks back that showed Lois Lane climbing out of the water, you know, the oh, bath times at Ridgemont those, High scene. Those tits looked so bad on her, I'm sorry. Somebody but, did a bad they? job. Oh. They looked, but they were not that big, though. Not that big, but they looked really fake. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. I guess I wasn't looking close. I just noticed that they weren't, like, huge. But she still was very sexy coming oh, out. Oh, yeah, I mean. she still looks sexy, but uh, they just didn't look right. Um, so another thing, I, this got brought up before about 
violence towards women. And I think it's really important to make a distinction between violence that happens in comic books where people are getting beaten up and getting the shit kicked out of them all the time, which is what comic books are about to a certain extent. Yes. But women specifically are targets of sexual violence. Men are never targets of sexual violence. And that reflects our society because sexual violence is inflicted on women to a great extent. Um, what I really don't like is in a comic book, and this doesn't happen as often as it used to, but when a woman is threatened with sexual violence to get at the male character, so it's somebody's girlfriend who's being threatened with rape or, or something like that, merely as some way to punish the, the superhero. So I can't kill you, I can't punch you because you're invulnerable, so I'm going to do something to your girlfriend. And then she just becomes a piece of an object, a possession. And I think that's very demeaning. And I'm glad that it doesn't happen as often as it used to, but it still happens. So is there... Um, is it wrong to say, though, that every single uh, portrayal of violence against a woman in comics always has some uh, small nugget of, of a sexual thing to it? Is that yeah. just generalizing? I don't, I, yeah, that's generalizing. I don't think that's true. Yeah, I can't say there's any that kind of uh, atmosphere whenever Aunt May gets smacked around. <laughs> <laughs> that you think, oh, that's just for sexual uh, shock. Yeah. But, you know, there is a lot of the way that fights between women superheroes are drawn that, that is done to titillate. I mean, it's, it's done to show off their tits and show off their asses and like, ooh, a cat fight, right? That's so exciting because clothes might get ripped off and you might see something. And that's just completely gratuitous and I don't know that anything will ever be done about that. But the violence itself, I mean, if it's a violent world that people live in, violence is violence. And that is what a comic world is. I mean, it's a, sure. I mean, there's no sure. mistaking that comics are violent, whether there's a fight scene in it or not. I mean, these are these are people who are constantly on either sides of good or evil. So mm -hmm. the it's, violence it's is the, there. It's the mixing of the sex with the violence that starts to get creepy. Hmm. That wasn't and that long at all. <laughs> no, I just I, I've always worried about the dehumanization, though. That's. In this world that you see, you know, you'll see the the five year old who who winds up killing his three year old, you know, brother or sister because they they're following wrestling moves or or just things like that. Along those lines, it just it, it worries me when you see stuff like what we first started talking about with the Green Lantern in your comic book, and it's just I just think the writer has the writer himself has to rein himself in. And just think about sometimes the impact. I, I just sometimes don't think they think about that impact on society. And I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm going way too deep off the deep end. But I just, that's, that was my take on the whole thing. And I just worry about, you know, dehumanization. So do you, you think know, the tricky thing oh, with comics also is that there's... I mean, I have such mixed feelings about a rating system, but it's so hard for someone who doesn't know the genre to know necessarily what to give their kids, unless, like, clearly, like, Donald Duck or something like that. But at what age do you start transitioning into some of the other books? Mm -hmm. I, mean, I know because I've read them, but someone... Well, that's your answer. Yeah, I, but not every person is going to necessarily... Yeah. I'd like it to be easy for somebody to look on a shelf and go, oh, that's for kids, and give that to their kid to make them happy when they're doing whatever else. Because then the kid will at least be exposed and interested in what they're doing. But no, you're right. The parent has ultimate responsibility for knowing what's going on in the book. And that's where the good and friendly comic book store comes in, where you can go in and talk to the person about what's appropriate for certain ages. Yes, there but if go. it's a guy behind the counter, they might flirt with her. And that'll <laughs> totally C-block the whole purpose of... Talking. You're such a MILF. <laughs> <laughs> I saw it on somebody's license plate the other day. God. Anyway. Um, really? Somebody had yeah, MILF? Yeah, I did. It was really horrible. Um, and I was driving my mom's car. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Hey, Jamie, just to play devil's advocate for a minute here, Good. do you think that writers should self-censor? Uh, well, they, they, every writer self-censors. I mean... Do they? they? Well... Yeah, because you have to decide what you're going to put on the page and what you're not going to put on the page. And okay, but that's how a far... decision. Yeah, and, that, and that's what all I'm saying is is that a writer himself has to, should think, if I'm going to write this down and it's going to be part of my story, do I really want, especially with a comic book, do I really want the artist to, you know, how do I want the artist to 
portray this? How do I want this to come across on the page? I mean, when you're writing, uh, you know, just for prose, you can you can decide how you're going to describe it. You can just, you can decide the description. In a comic book, it's kind of a depending on how you're doing it. It could be left. You know, the writer could say, "This is what I want," and then the artist could put it in, and so on and so forth. You just to me, you just need to think about. A, where your audience is, and B, what do I really want to show them? And sometimes that that can cross the line as far as I'm concerned. And, you know, I can look at it and go, whoa, did they really need to show that? Did they really need, I mean, uh, one of our great debates when we first started was, did he really need to show Booster Gold getting his brain splattered all over the... Blue Beetle. Blue, Blue Beetle. Yeah, I'm sorry. I say it's late. God, I've been working. Uh, Blue Beetle get his brains splattered all over... You know, all over the panel. Did they really need to show that? I didn't think they did. I thought it was just thrown in there purely for gratuitous violence, purely for shock value. Did they need to show it? Because you want to, you know, do I want, now do I want to show this to my seven year old, you know, niece or nephew who I'm trying to get into comics and I want to get interested in what's going on in the DC universe? I want to show them this because this is showing them what's coming down the line. But do I really want to show them a comic book with that in? Do, did the writer and artist really need to put that in there? And that's all I'm saying is sometimes they just need to maybe pull back and think, well, who am I trying to appeal to? And maybe I shouldn't show that. That's all I'm really saying. I'm not looking for anybody to come down, you know, censorship of any kind. I think it's just as the writer itself, you sometimes have to, you know, rein it in and, and just decide what you really want to show and how you want to show it. I, I, so why do you think that particular, ep- in that issue, why do you think they did that? What what kept them from reining it in? Uh, for, well, can I answer? For, for yeah, but, wait, wait, what are we talking about? The, the, the woman or the blue, blue beetle? The blue beetle thing. For me, I didn't feel that it was gratuitous at all. For me, I felt that it hammered home the idea that this character is now dead because when your brains are all over the wall you're not coming back you know superman ain't coming back from that wolverine's healing factor isn't helping him when his brains are on the wall you're over you're done so uh that was the impression that i got i went wow they're for real something big and something serious is happening in the dc universe this is i didn't i never felt like oh come on how that's that's crazy they don't need to show that I didn't feel like they they should have pulled a Hitchcock there and leave it to the mind's eye. I felt that they made a point by doing that. Because then you wouldn't have believed that he died. If he right, you if would he expect, like in every other comic, that he'll just come back. And what's to keep him from coming back out of this one? There's, it's very easy to come back. I mean, it's, it's a freaking comic book, first of all. Yeah, but this is a, this is it, a little it's, more... It's still easy to come back, So, but they didn't... I mean, I, they... If you want to see powerful deaths, look in Crisis on Infinite Earths. There are powerful deaths in that book. Uh, Supergirl giving up her life to save... Well, she got her guts blown out. But you didn't see her get her guts sure blown out. Sure you did. No, you did not. Somebody get Somebody your Crisis go, yeah, go trade. Because you, you get... You, you see don't see... Her. Uh, you, you tell me you see her entrails hanging out. You, you see, see she is blown through the gut. If but you, but I, I'm still telling you, you're not going to see it. Wouldn't the burn the gut. kind of? Just, you're not going to even when, even 1985, 86 when that came out, I went, whoa! She just got her entire midsection blown out of her gut. Okay, I I still I but didn't the see it. The were still intact. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, wait a minute. Okay, but but still, I mean, there. I thought there were more powerful deaths in that book, and you didn't have to see. Somebody let me see it. No, no, no. Let me see other it. Other than us, then want to see. You tell me what that looks like, Tasha. But anyway, it's. It, I I don't know. T- to me, I mean, kind of a little bit an identity cri- identity crisis. But more than that, that told me that this is a story that's probably not for a, a seven, eight, ten. You know, this is an adult story. And as much as you know, I I might want my twelve year old nephew to to get more into comics. Having read it, it's, this isn't one that I would say, look, I want you to know what's going on in the DCU. I'm going to give this to you. To me, this is something that's more adult driven basically because I don't know if he would understand it and I think to hand him something that he probably wouldn't even understand to begin with is defeats the purpose okay I'm, I'm looking at it and no I, I'm sorry there's no blood Tasha what'd you, what'd you there's think? no guts as as opposed to what they did in in you know oh Oh yeah, but that wasn't the question no it, yes it was because the question I mean, was you're talking did they have to ago. show the splatter 
and they don't have, they didn't have to show that. That was. You what know, do you think, Lena? Did what? you read that book? No, I, I didn't. And I, I just, I don't want to interrupt what you're saying because it's really interesting. But now I'm very curious to know if each of you can cite a place where you think somebody crossed the line. We know what Jamie's is with Blue Beetle. Brian, Peter, what, what do you guys think? And, and Catherine, uh, what do you guys think? Is there a place where you can say that crossed the line for me? They shouldn't have done it. I don't. No, I, I, I'll, I'll, my, my answer is quick and easy because I said it before. I don't believe art should ever have to, have to defend itself. So I've never been offended by anything. Never felt that anything crossed the line. I guess the only thing that sticks in my mind, and it's been a long time, so I don't know how it holds up by today's standards, but I seem to recall reading some issues of Lobo that, as I was reading them, I went, wow, they printed that in a comic book. You know, some of the sex jokes or whatever. Like the paramilitary Christmas special and stuff like that? Yeah, it was just like, wow, that was... I hope a kid doesn't read that, you know, because it's not... It wasn't an adult comic. It wasn't a Vertigo book. It was well. Just, it did say for mature readers. On it the did cover. say for mature readers, but you know there were also other books that said for mature readers that never had anything like that in it. So I mean, I'm not saying that it shouldn't have been published. I just saying when I read it, I went, "Ooh, ah, wow, that's in a comic book." Because we read our favorite, one of our favorite series, Preacher, and there's nothing more offensive out there. Than well, Preacher, but it's a Vertigo that book, be, and that so you yeah, know, still, still I know comic. going in that well, yeah, that's what I that's what I hope to see in a, in a Vertigo book. Because yeah, yeah. what ja- you know, what Jamie's saying is, you know, the average reader going in and going, "Oh, look at this! Look at these colorful pictures!" You know, they're going to see Steve Dillon's artwork. It looks kind of bright, kind of you know, just normal, and all of a sudden you got Hair Star getting it up the butt. You know, what I mean. <laughs> Yeah, but your average your average reader isn't going to go and buy Preacher. That he's, but your average reader who picks up a book that has Superman on the front cover, it has Batman on the front cover, that has Wonder Woman on the front cover, and starts reading it and gets to that point, and suddenly there's a hero's brain splattered all over gratuitously. Uh, it's just they took a step there that I just, for me, and, and I'm not. You know, Peter, you say, I don't believe art should be censored and blah, blah, blah. You're telling me you have never, ever, ever seen anything that you went, whoa, this, you know, it may, maybe it's not my cup of tea, but they might have gone over the line. I read uh, Identity Crisis. I mean, no, I mean I anything. Read, or, I mean, no, I, I'm there's talking, that movie that, what was that movie that, um, it goes backwards in time, I think, where the where the one woman gets, uh, it's an, it's, I don't know if it's a, art film or whatever where she gets raped and really violently like a it's like a brutal attack on film and i mean it's not real but they they're filmed it you know what i mean and it no and it caused great controversy i mean it was because it was so realistic and but i know it's a movie i know these are comics i mean i'm not trying to put myself on a pedestal or, or anything i've seen theater with naked people and you know about uh different topics and you know i i i don't i've seen the um who was the guy with Christ in the P thing? The the, the art guy that uh, took all those photographs. And, mm, I, uh, I know he. Um, I can't think of it now either. Uh, he got he got you know. I want to say Warren Saul, but that's not. That's no, not I can't is. remember what his name is. But I, that, I know you're talking. Yeah. Ma- Maplethorpe. Maplethorpe. I, 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 what I, offends me is bad comics. That's what offends me. <laughs> I, I don't. I, I can see in the, the incident with Blue Beetle. I, I I don't agree with you, Jamie, but I can see. You know, there's certain things where, you know, being a huge Batman fan that I am, there was some uh, thing that I saw where, you know, amateurs can do little movies. And it's one I bought at the Baltimore Comic Con. But there's this one, uh, The Death of Batman. And it, pretty much this guy, he was able to, to capture Batman, just some Joe Schmo. And that, there's just one scene there, it looks as though he's being raped. And to me, it was like, you, you know, you, at least for me, there's certain, you know, he's Superman, Batman. I, I you put them up on some kind of a pedestal to so whether it be in a comic or some amateur movie to see them being degraded like that where it almost looks as though they're being raped or whatever i mean t- to me that's kind of taking it too far because I, I don't know if you grow up being your childhood hero i i mean it's you know of course batman superman they're they're fictitious but still when you, even when as an adult you, there's a reason why you read them because to, there's to some extent you are looking up to them still as being a a childhood hero and to see them degraded like that is just ridiculous but you know an identity crisis even though you didn't see it the fact that that well i don't want to give anything away for those but with a rape in there 
I'm glad you didn't see it because, you know, that, to me, rape is one of those things where it's a man or woman is, is very degrading and it's, it's more it's about control than it is about sex. But still, it's just kind of taking things to a different level and it's, I hate to think of it in the real world, let alone in, in a fantasy world as well. well. I just worry in a medium where we, you know, we're, we're trying to get more and more kids to read it and we're trying to get, you know, a mass appeal and it has that stigma of... Uh, there is that stigma out there that it's a kitty, you know, a kitty fair, um, and it's not adult. You know, so and, I, and I've been I advocate the fact that it is more adult. There's more mature stuff, but then there are kids stuff. And when they put the more when they don't separate that, and you know, we we don't bring them in gradually. I just worry that 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 takes what we're doing and what we love a step backwards and then we have to just defend it even more and now I, I know Peter's going to say we, we should never have to defend it and blah 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 it should live on its own merits and blah 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 but there is that, that that's in a utopian world that's in a world that we don't live in uh, and it's just one of those I, I think that writers and artists can do that when they're just have they just have to do it they can do it creatively they can still you can still blow blue Beatles head off but you can do it off screen you can have a big bang and a thump and the body hits the ground and you didn't have to see the splatter or the you know the bullet coming out and it's still as powerful it still shows that they he died but they took to me they took that step that they just didn't need to take well here's the other thing there is a, there is the comics code authority and whether you agree with it or not they let both those books go with no yeah, it's pretty bomb. ineffective, that whole system. Yeah, that's what I mean, it, it is, but, I mean, it was created for There's this really big gray them. area, and I think it falls between, like, 11 and 15. There's mm-hmm. this huge developmental thing that happens at that age, right? I mean, 11-year-old reading a Superman book and seeing something like that, totally different from a 15-year-old sure. reading it and seeing it. And it's just hard to know. Like, I'm not even sure what the exact age audiences are for any of these books. Mm-hmm. I started reading them when I was 13, 14 years old. It was different. I mean, you just hear from the, the companies that they're trying to get the kids to come back and read. They're trying to make, you know, this crisis is, is supposed to redefine the universe, bring in, making it easier for people to, to come to the DC universe. And then when they come, you know, to book that's introducing them to come to the DC universe, you see this. It just, to me, it just didn't need to be done. Well, now, what happens if, say, rather than get killed, his... His arm would have been like. Uh, well, cut I, off I, I, I I just I didn't mind. I don't mind the okay, fact that he got killed. It was just the way they portrayed it. They didn't need to portray it that way. Death is a part of life, and I I'm not saying shield children from death or anything like that. But it's just you, you know, it's the reason you don't see some things on the evening news that you know. The, they censor the evening news to show you certain things, but they won't show you other things. It's it's one of those things you just don't need to see that. You need to watch the Spanish news. They show everything. <laughs> Jeez. Those crazy Spanish news. They do. News. I love it. Why not? You, you know, just can't understand it. Might as well be entertaining. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay, moving on. <laughs> Ooh, how Send about those them? letters to Peter. How about them eagles, Catherine? Wow. <laughs> We're a Steelers household, actually. I'll yeah. pretend you didn't say that. Okay, you're right off the, you're right <laughs> off the list. Sorry. <laughs> Just kidding. See, and that's where we got derailed the last time, because then I brought up the whole thing about, you know, these are you know parents that complain about violence in comics are the same parents that take their kids to watch a football game. I don't get it. I don't get it. Can we, can we well, not, we're not, no, don't, not have this not conversation again? But <laughs> I, I, I don't see any difference in my mind. Or let, let them What's play. What's your favorite shade of lipstick? Mortal Kombat. <laughs> or, you know. Vice City, yeah, it's all the it's all the same. Everybody's a hypocrite. Okay, what uh, <laughs> lip gloss? Yes or no? <laughs> what else do you got? We only have a not too much more time. You guys have anything else you need? You want to lay on us? Well, just thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. I think sure. we did everything we wanted to do. This is great. Yeah, it's cool, cool to have our first female listener that we know of. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, she'll always be the first, whether or not she was the first or not. She'll be our first. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, I know what I want to... Wait, wait, I do want to say something. I want to say that Catherine's going to be on my show in a couple of weeks. We're going to do an all Harlan Ellison episode, and we're going to talk about a boy and his dog. 
all to do with that. It's going to be great. Cool. You know, I've never read anything by him. You are missing so much. Talk about an artist who doesn't self-censor. Oh, cool. Well, yeah. <laughs> I've, I, my only real exposure to him was the, uh, the Dream Corridor uh, series from Dark Horse. I did read a whole bunch of those, and there was some really good stuff, and I've... I have a couple of his books. I've picked them up for you know here and there at book sh- at book sales and stuff like that. But looking forward to hearing what you uh, ladies have to say. You should go and find the stories that correspond to the Dream Corridor comics and read them, and then read the comics again. Yeah, what, the one that really was was if I had a mouth, I could scream. Was that the one? <laughs> that was close. Okay, well, we'll, we'll go, enlighten me. It's was called it? I Have No Mouth and I'm a Scream. And I'm a Scream. That yeah. was that was a really good adaptation and from what I had read like when he his little notes in the back, you know, it really made me want to go out and get that at least get that one. That one looked really interesting. You should absolutely read it. It will it will crush you. It's an amazing story. It will crush you. <laughs> we uh, we just got an email from Brian Miller literally just like five minutes ago. Uh, he just wanted to let everyone know that he's updated his website with a whole bunch of new information, hi-fi-design.com. Uh, he's got an interview with Joe Corony. Do you guys know who that is, Joe Corony? No. Spell the last name? C-O-R-R-O-N-E-Y. I'm, I'm, I'm looking here. Yeah. Joe Corony creates amazing artwork for Lucasfilm, Star Wars Insider Magazine, <clears throat> excuse me, and other Star Wars products, including games and books. Well, there you have it. So that's who Joe Corony is. Yeah. Hey, did you want me to tell my Skywalker Ranch story? I think. Oh yeah, that'd be cool. There. Oh yeah. So it's very quick. There are two stories. The the second story I'll tell first, which is when I went there to get those comic books that I, I sent to Shane, and we got to see their new campus, which they are now vacating to move to an even newer campus, and they spent like fifteen million dollars on it, and now they're going to leave it empty. So that was pretty impressive. But the very first time I went there. Um, we were having lunch in the main dining room, and um, it was right after the first crappy movie came out. What was it called? I can't remember. Phantom Menace. Um, Phantom, Phantom Menace, right? So we're sitting in the dining room, and we're talking with the, the, our friends who work there and chatting, and, and my friend Bob is going on about what a crappy movie it was and saying, God, the acting sucked and blah, blah, blah. And his friend David, who's sitting next to him, is going, Bob, Bob, trying to get his attention. I'm like, well, I just want to tell you how much I hated this movie, and I spent all this money. He's like, Bob, Bob, look, just look over there. And, he shut up, and we all kind of turned our heads, and there was George, oh. and like two tables away, <laughs> trying really hard not to listen to what we were saying. And so we all took a deep breath, and then I said, but you know, I love that movie. I thought it was great. <laughs> hey, the pod race was really cool. The pod race was cool. That was the best part of that movie. The rest of it sucked. <laughs> Natalie Portman was still pretty good, too. Oh, oh, and the lightsabers at the end, you got to love the light. I only go to see the lightsaber. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I mean, just the, like the last half hour is all you need. That's right. I was working at the movie theater when that was out, and every time I would walk through the theater to go up to the projection booth or something, and if it was at the pod race or the lightsaber duel, I would stop and watch it before I went upstairs because it was it was worth seeing. You know, like I, I I saw the pod race scene like fifty times, literally in the theater. It was great. Yeah, but you I mean yeah. you should have punched him in the. Go, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Sorry, Danny. No, go ahead. You you were talking though. I was just going to say, they make those lightsabers that um, are plastic, and they make the noise when you swish them through the air, because they have these little motion sensors in them. Yes. I got to hold one and play with it. It was really cool. You see them in San Diego, right? No, this is at Lucas when I was up there. They just have them laying around. It's like, oh, here, want to play with this? Because uh-huh. I saw, like, every other guy at San Diego was buying one of those. Yeah, those were all over. I was going to say, you should just you know, punch them in the balls for Jar Jar Binks. That's what I would have done. <laughs> Yeah, this one's for Jar Jar Binks. Boom! Right there. <laughs> As security escorts you all. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> As he ranch. takes everything you own. <laughs> oh, no, someone punched Mr. Lucas, Mr. Lucas in the balls again. <laughs> <laughs> this is the all balls episode. We had an all tits one, now it's the all balls episode. I was going to say, since I can't say tits, I'll say balls. <laughs> you can say tits, Jamie. Okay. <laughs> we're, we're already up to, like, we probably have more than 12 this episode. Tits, 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 tits. <laughs> I'm going to start singing it. Oh, my God. I hope that we're the ones responsible for getting an explicit tag on your show. That would be an accomplishment. See, the problem is you See, can't... See, we bring women in, and it gets all so explicit. That's the the problem. problem is you can't put explicit on a per-episode basis. It's on a show-only basis. Right. And really? so I've been hesitant to put it on the show because 
we don't we don't abuse the language, so it's fucking only fucking a. a. <laughs> I was just gonna say, except when Matt's on. Let's see when Matt's here. Come uh, on. So you know, which, which may be the last episode. <laughs> That's right. I had to make up for the missing episodes. I haven't been in for a while. All right. Well, cool. Now, Catherine, you can go go to sleep so you can wake up tomorrow morning. What time is it out in California? Uh, it's early. It's, uh, 8, 8 o'clock. 8.30, 8 30. yeah. I've got to do a podcast after this. <laughs> so so we'll, we'll call in. <laughs> Catherine, promise me that when you get to work tomorrow, the first thing you do is go to the Yahoo video search and search for Numa Numa. N-U-M-A space N-U-M-A. And you got to watch the Numa Numa dancer guy and then send me an email and tell me that your entire office will not be laughing hysterically. <laughs> okay? I promise you. Okay. I wouldn't steer you wrong. I, I was singing it all night last night, so it gets, like, caught in your head. <laughs> it can't be catchier than a damn wiggle song, so I'm sure it, anything will be better. Yeah, and it's brilliant. parents out there know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the gist is that the Numa Numa song, it's, it's, it was a... A Romanian dance hit that was in the clubs in Romania last summer or something that was very popular. And then there's this little chubby kid. Well, he's not little. I mean, he's like 20, early 20s or whatever. Sitting in front of his computer with his webcam, dancing to this song, making an ass out of himself. But it's hilarious. So. It's so good because he is so unselfconscious and he's clearly having a wonderful time. Just grooving to this song. Yeah. That's why it's so good. Exactly. It's wonderful. Okay. Well, thank you so much, ladies, for joining us. It was a wonderful experience. Well, hope, thank you. Hope you, you had fun. Very welcome. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually losing sleep over this. I had to come to this one, so. Thank you, Jamie. We appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we'll take you out of the show, so you can stick with us to the very end, if you'd like. No mess ups. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, a reminder that this episode was sponsored by the New York City. Comic Con, which is February 25th and 26th at the Jacob Javits Center in New York City. And uh, its uh, tickets are $25 for one day or $35 for both days. And uh, it's going to be a heck of a show with a lot of special guests, including us. So come on down. That's all the reason you need to come. That's right. And uh, if you'd like to send us an email, you can do so at comicgeekspeak at gmail.com and uh, visit our website at comicgeekspeak.com. Big thanks to Bob at GameCircuit.net for hosting the files and a big thanks to upallnightgaming.com for hosting the website. Please vote for us at Podcast Alley and vote for Lena at Podcast Alley while you're at it. We can both take all your votes. Damn straight. And... Uh, as usual, we're brought to you in conjunction with WorldFamousComics.com. And once again, we are uniting the world's mightiest heroes, one listener at a time. See you next time.